Hello and welcome to Talk from Superheroes. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Rivemi. And I'm Diana McCollum. And you're listening to Talk from Superheroes, where every week we discuss a piece of heroic television or film. And this week on the podcast, we are continuing our robot month here at the podcast. And uh, we're talking about Alita Battle Angel. We're talking about robots. She's technically a cyborg, I guess. We're loosey-goosey with the, the theme of the month. It's a mechanical month. How about that? Oh, mechanical month. I like the alliteration of the double M as well. You know what? It's now mechanical month. Mechanical month for kids. Um, <laughs> kids? Yeah. Maybe stop listening. I don't, no, not for kids. Not for kids. <laughs> Especially this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'm going to get into some stuff. Oh, okay. All right. So this one's not for the kids then. I mean, like, they might be less entertained by the social issues I introduce. There's there's a lot that I think will not entertain the kids on this one. Tuck mm. the kids into bed, as we always say at the beginning of every podcast, is tuck the kids in, curl up with a curl up by the fire, and get ready for the warm radio listenings of Talk from Superheroes. For, we, your, for your mechanical month needs. For your mechanical month needs. We always say it when it's our regular mechanical month here at the podcast. Uh, so this month we were talking about all robot movies, all month. Uh, last week on the podcast, we talked about RoboCop. If you do want to hear our conversation about RoboCop 2, we talked about that over on the Patreon page, patreon.com slash from superheroes. It's the exclusive episode this month for our patrons. So if you're interested in more RoboCop 2 stuff, uh, you're going to want to head on over and uh, check out patreon.com slash from superheroes. It's a, it's a fun one. It's a fun one. He's still a robot cop, but a little bit different. No. No. We, we can't, can't have, have that. that. It's a little, a little sneak peek. A little sneak peek there. Uh, but we're talking about uh, Alita Battle Angel uh, this month. I... I Flashbacks to, to Avatar. We're talking about James Cameron's Robert Rodriguez's Alita Battle Angel. Yeah, we didn't do that on purpose, but it felt like I was like, did we subconsciously do this? Maybe old Jim, maybe old Jim sleep slept on in, slipped on in, slipped on in, right He's, into the su subconscious. I mean, we did have a big December of James Cameron. We yeah. did three James Cameron movies in December, and I feel like he got in a got at us. He lives in our head for, rent free. Unfortunate. He yes. could pay rent. And how about He's a very rich man. And I'm also going to throw this disclaimer on the episode, too. We were talking about Alita Battle Angel. We have not Ooh. read the manga. Mm, uh, we will important. not be referencing it at all. If it is your favorite thing, we do not know it. We will not reference it. You will not find the justification you are looking for here. I always have to say it when something has a very specific fan base because sometimes we'll be like, we're talking about just the movie, only the movie, haven't read the thing. And then that week we'll get a one-star review that's like, clearly you didn't read issue 17. We didn't. We are not trying to dupe you or deceive you or fool you into a, just, into a validation that we're not going to give you. We haven't read the manga. We will not reference it. We are baby idiots about this property. We can't be more clear about this. Thank you, Andrew. I love this disclaimer of this is a review of a movie. Yeah. And we just saw the movie. Absolutely. I mean, to be fair, we do touch into reference points for a lot of like the superhero stuff we do. But Sometimes. this time, big disclaimer, we have no idea what the manga is about. We've got nothing. We know nothing. If that's how you got here... Then sorry, sorry, stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get off the I'm train, so, or have fun. Have a fun ride on Ooh, this train while you're or here. Or relax more. Relax more. Cuddle in with your kids cuddle in front of the fire. No, the kids are in bed. Oh, you're there in bed. Okay, cuddle the kids in, are in front bed. of the fire alone, mm -hmm. and just have a chill time hearing us talk about just the movie Alita Battle Angel. I think that this is all. Well and good. Well, mm. let's let's get into the discussion. Let's talk about Alita Battle Angel. We're here. We're all friends. We've seen Alita Battle Angel, only the film, not read the manga. Let's start with the usual, the simple question. Diana, did you like it? I did not. I did not like Alita Battle Angel. Um, it looks pretty good for the most part. The effects are, it's, it looks way better than it is. It's got no story. It's got nothing to say. It's got 
I feel wildly offended by just the look of this girl and a lot of choices in general that the movie makes. Um, real born sexy yesterday happening, which I never enjoy unless it's Brendan Fraser. He's the only one who can pull it off sometimes. Um, so yeah, just like no chemistry between anyone. The story's not interesting. The world's not interesting. Motorball is the only cool thing happening in this movie and it doesn't happen enough. Um, so mostly I'm bored and slightly offended and I don't know who characters are or what their motivation is. And I'm like, some of it looks pretty good though. Like, I'll give you that. Some of this choreography is also very good and the animation of the choreography is very good. Um, but other than that is just a lot of robots getting ripped asunder, um, which sounds kind of more exciting than it is. So that's, uh, so I did not like Alita Battle Angel. Andrew, did you like Alita Battle Angel? Uh, I didn't like it, but I don't hate it either. Uh, I actually think that like it is, it's bland at times. It has a real YA vibe. I do think that like have. maybe it doesn't lean into it enough. Where I'm like this, it has a PG thirteen rating, but I feel like this should be marketed entirely for preteens. This movie I feel like is not at all intended for adults, except for a few moments where it's very much only for adults. Wildly violent, it, yes. Yeah, so it's it's a weird mixed bag where I feel like it lives kind of between two worlds, but there are moments of this that I I genuinely think are great. Like there are some there are some good performances. There is some wacky zany stuff that feels like unpretentious silly wedged in between moments where it takes itself very YA melodrama super seriously. Mm -hmm. So there's some stuff where I'm like, it's so absurd. It's actually kind of playful and I like the vibe. A few performances that work. Generally, I, I agree, it looks really good. It looks good. Even when we will discuss it looks upsetting, it's intentional. I think everyone accomplished what they set out to do at the maximum ability of, of, of artistic capability. Which makes it worse. To a certain degree. <laughs> well, we, we can unpack that yes. more. Uh, but I think that everyone here, uh, in, in the, terms of the visual look of the film, accomplished what they set out to do. So I think it looks good. I think it has some fun performances, a few fun moments. Surprisingly peppy, considering how much like gook is going on. I think it's a very well edited film. The editing of this is tight as hell, and I think that might be the star player of this movie is is the editor. Um, but other than that, I feel like yeah, the the story is just kind of bland gook uh, in a mildly offensive project that doesn't know if it's for a twelve year old only or for wildly angry adults. I can get behind pretty much all of this. I love what you say about the edit, because I think that's very true. For a two-hour movie I didn't like, it didn't really feel like it dragged or anything. I wasn't like, this scene will never end. I was just like, what is going on? But oh, the scene's over, it's fine. Because it's edited very tightly. And even when, especially where the editing stands out for me is that it doesn't feel long and drawn out. I agree with you there. And especially when mo half of the dialogue, more than half of the dialogue, I would say, is gobbledygook. It's mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. exposition. Mm -hmm. Because this movie does, its dialogue often feels like it is someone describing a manga to me. And like it is not like the story of that story. It is just someone describing it all to me. So there are entire scenes where it's like, the hunter killer Zapan won't fight Gorinchka because he works for a vector who's just a pawn of the eyes of Noba of Zalem. But once I find the berserker body from Urm from the pre-fall era, and I'm like... This is dialogue <laughs> that makes me bleed from the ears and eyes and everything. And the editing and audio cues are so just kind of like, not overworked, but peppy enough that the energy keeps going, mm -hmm. even when it is all just expositional nonsense. So like five stars, nothing but bangers from the entire like editing team on this film the fact that it has any energy or enthusiasm is shocking. That is a great point. Yeah, it, the the not the words are such nonsense, and it's it's always a problem in fantasy, especially when it's not even fantasy. It's like future dystopia, like it's set on Earth, just way in the future. Like it's Mars, it's Earth, um, but there's literally no recognizable words, and it's like, why doesn't anyone have a normal name? Yes. Why doesn't anyone have a name where I'm like? That's John. <laughs> this guy, John. It's like everyone has a name that doesn't exist in the real world. Zalem, Nova, Zareem, 
uh, Alita. Alita might be a name. Alita's a name. Alita's yeah. a name. Apologies. But like, just like, there's not, and it's maybe the only name you grab onto. Mm-hmm. And there's just no names where you're like, that's a, th-. even Mars is called Erm. Yeah. Because they're the United Republic of Mars. And I'm like, if you could just say Mars, it would really help me out here. There's a word <laughs> for people from Mars. Martians. Martians. It's right there, but they're the Erm. Yeah. You're not a Martian. You're an Erm. Yeah. But she should be a Martian. Yeah. And she's not a soldier. She's a berserker from Erm. Mm-hmm. She's an Erm berserker. Berserker and that's at very least clear. is a word. Yeah. And, that, and it is a word, but even when words are words, they're words replacing other words. Mm. They'd be like, she's a Martian soldier. No, she's an Erm berserker. These are bounty hunters. No, they're hunter killers, which are licensed bounty hunters. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So yes, how yes. is that any different from the other words we already use for that exact job title? There is no difference at all. It is the exact job title. So everything is just switched around to become nonsense with no motivation or reason other than just making it feel like high-minded sci-fi when there's no real thought or high-mindedness behind it at all. Yeah, like, why is Zalem just not, like, high New York? Or, like, you know what I mean? Sky City. Why did all of the words disappear after the fall? Mm. Like, someone would have remembered the name of cities, and, like, names would have continued on. Like, we've had names around, like, the same names have been used for thousands of years in human society, but they're all gone. Yeah. Except for, actually, this would have been great. Uh, Christoph Waltz's character is Dr. Ido, and Ido doesn't really stick out. But his first name's Dyson. I'm like, oh, like a vacuum. I would have been like, ah, like a vacuum. But they never call him Dyson. They never call him Dyson. Nope, they call him Ido. And especially when he's the only one I remember because I'm like, this is this is a, a James Cameron movie. I'm like, it's James Cameron's second Dr. Dyson. Uh, oh, Dr. Dr. Dyson is the one who dissects the arm and invents Skynet and Terminator 2. Oh, uh, it's good. Dr. James Dyson, if I remember correctly. So there's two different scientific Dr. Dysons from James Cameron movies. Maybe they're related. Uh, they're Maybe obviously, it was pre-fall there grandfather. We there we go. It's the pre-fall, post-fall. And pre-war, post-war are already terms we use. I don't know. It was a fall. The cities fell out of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> wildly, wildly yeah. dumb stuff. So yeah, just way too much to learn about this world because it's not just the future. There's also like, we've been to Mars apparently, like, like, and we've come back. We've been to Mars and back. Yeah. And the world's destroyed. There's just too many timelines and things. And things that don't tie in or matter really. Like, really the only reason she is a Martian or that that has anything into play is that their tech was really good and she has a really good body. Mm. And she could just be person with strong body. That is it. That's the entirety of that backstory. Person with strong body. Strong body person here and their body strong. That is 100% of the, of the story impact it has. So I'm like, why is no one bringing up like, we haven't talked to any of the Mars people in generations. Are they still out there? Did we colonize the galaxy? Why there was a space war on Mars never comes into play in any way. Never comes up. And they only seem like wild, even like mildly aware that the Martians were their enemy. I'm going to call them Martians. They're not arms. The mm. Martians were their enemy. Like when they're like, when they, when she gets the suit out of the ship, they're like, oh shit, she's a Martian. And no one's like, oh no, that's an enemy. Or like, we're not like worried about the Martians coming back, but also like, should we be? There's just like, no no feeling of what we should be feeling about this martianness. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Oh. Yep. No idea what we're what we're supposed to feel about it. And then just like conflicting sci-fi ideals where it just feels like a lot of this stuff is just cut and paste from things that already existed but in a less intelligent, less thought out way. You know, like even just this like, oh, it's 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 a sky city. It's uh, the the upper class are literally upper and the lower mm. class are literally lower. I'm like Oh, Final Fantasy? I played this in Final Fantasy. And Final Fantasy was out before this. And it was this. Both the manga and the movie. So I'm like, so it's just Final Fantasy? And be like, and then they play Motorball. And even like the Wikipedia for this movie says Motorball. It's basically Rollerball. And Rollerball, a film that came out before the manga and this movie. So this movie is legitimately just like, okay, cut and paste that, cut and paste that, cut and paste that. 
How those things interplay and interconnect, it doesn't matter. We're just cutting and pasting some gobbledygook from other fantasies and science fiction and putting it into one thing. Absolutely, because Alita is very fifth element. I am a born sexy yesterday, all-powerful being who doesn't know what food is, and I'm super cute. Yeah. Um, what was her name? Lilo? Lilo. Uh, Lilo, yeah. Lilo in... Uh, or Lilin? I think Lilo. Lilo, Lilo yeah. I think Lilo. Yeah. So yeah, she's she's just that character from Fifth Element, but um, her English is instantly good instead of having to learn it. Everything else is the exact same. She falls in love with the first man she meets who's very mediocre, willing to do anything for him. Uh, it's... It's, it's all been done, but they didn't take any of these elements and were like, well, we know what the story is and we have a real theme, but we're doing something interesting with it. It really is just like, that's going to look cool. Yeah. And it looks cool. Yeah. Which I think really says a lot about like why pre-Avatar James Cameron chose this as the thing to adapt. Because oh, it was going to look cool. Because it was going to look cool. And like James Cameron is just someone who inherently as a script writer, who he wrote this movie, uh, even though he didn't direct it. It's one of the few movies that he's written and not directed. But he intended to before he decided to dedicate his career to Avatar. Uh, his words. Uh, I'm so, Mr. Avatar I'm now. I'm Mr. Avatar now. Uh, so I think he chose chose to adapt this because he was like, it looks cool and it's meaningless, which is exactly my bag. I'm James Cameron. I like things that look good and are meaningless. What a strange and, trademark. And also give me a chance to drown an actor. I, I, oh. I don't even know if she filmed it underwater in this one, but I know, at least if, know when James wrote it, he was like, I'm looking forward to drowning an actor in this long underwater segment. If James had directed it, Rosa Salazar would have been drowned many times Absolutely. over. Absolutely. But I think Robert Rodriguez, from what I could tell, it looked very all CG, and I do not think he drowned that woman. No, no. I think good he's more respectful him. to his actors. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And it was quite a short scene as well. Mm -hmm. But for James, he left in like, all right, just got to go underwater for a second. Fine. <gasps> yeah, got Fine. It. For James. For James. He, yo, you want to be on set that day, James? God damn it. God damn, God it, damn James. it, James. It's the only of course day he you does. showed up. Oh, James showed up for the water day. Oh, he showed up for water day. Yeah. Of course. Absolutely, uh, of course. So written by James Cameron, directed right by Robert Rodriguez. The, the torch was handed once James went off to do Avatar. Uh, and for the most part, I actually think that like, with this, you know, not writing a new script, I do think Robert Rodriguez does a pretty good job with the performances and visual style, and I think actually succeeds as a director making this movie. I think as a director, there's some okay stuff going on. I think the lack of like any characters feeling like they have any connection to each other is on a, on a director. You need to get a little bit more charm and personality and connection out of people, even if they are in green screen suits, like all their faces, except for Alita's. Well, actually Alita was on set and like her face just got CG'd afterwards. Um, so like they're on set together. Like they are interacting together. This wasn't anyone in front of just like a floating tennis ball. Everyone was actually there. So I just feel like there's a directing miss of just any kind of human element. But there is a very big directing of like the action looks good. The incorporation of the CG is incredible. There is there are successes here. Mm -hmm. But I think there are just like boring failures. I can I can fully get behind that. Yeah, some boring failures, some more aggressive failures. Uh, do we want to get into the the major issue of it. Before we get into the major issue, I am going to give it a compliment before oh. I start. Uh, what you The thing you said earlier really stuck with me uh, in the opening of Do We Like It, which is um, you think it skews more YA. And I will say, I think if I saw this movie as like a 12 year old, it could easily be like my favorite movie. It feels like if you saw it at a developmental age, you could have been like, oh no, I love that movie. It's got, it's got romance and it's got robots and it just never stops moving. And she kills a guy when she only has one arm. And that's pretty actually cool. Um, we'll get into that later. So I do want to say, yeah, I think you're right about how it should have skewed a little younger. To and there's like, a bunch of other like random gook that they mentioned that I can look up later. I'm going like, to read the manga. Yeah. And when you're younger, it's like referencing things that you can find out about is in itself exciting, even when they are completely tertiary and unnecessary that in itself has an excitement to be like I can go look up what this thing is so yeah I think if they had skewed it a little bit younger removed some of the more violent elements which they even kind of felt like they did in post um, then I think actually could be quite a success of like four children but mm -hmm. it's definitely not four children because of the thing mostly we're about to talk about oh yeah yeah, yeah. well you go for it Ah, the eyes fucking suck. Everything about this fucking character. Fuck, I hate it. I hate it. It makes me so mad. And I get more mad because all the reviews from 
like people who liked it were like, oh, I feel so empowered. And they didn't mean that sarcastically. And she's just this tiny woman who's super strong, but she's got titties and her eyes are so big. And you would never do that to a male character. I hated it. Oh, fuck. I hated it so much. Yeah, you would you would never do it with a male character to be like, and final and finally when he got his own body, the area where his hog would be grew bigger. Whoa, he's a bit older than we thought he was. A g g g going. Look at his hog shape. But he's also still a teenager. But look how big his doing is. Yeah, he's a teen, but he's a man with a hell of a hog now. But I also want you to try to picture a male character with these giant eyes, who's supposed to be so powerful and strong and also cries every second scene and has their tears gently wiped away by another father figure in their life. Yeah, yeah. It's so insulting. And it's, she's a soldier robot that was programmed to cry. It's like, what are we, I don't know what we're doing everything. here. Over everything. Over absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. It reminded me of, I know I'm not a gamer, but there's a, there's a Tomb Raider game uh -huh. um, where Lara like cries every time she kills a guy, I guess. Oh, okay. And people were like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> this is... I know she's like an explorer and not a murderer, but like she's a murderer. Lita is a killer. Is a true murderer. And yeah. like every single thing that happens, just tears are rolling down her face. And I'm like, you get one. Yes. You gotta, you, tears have no impact if they're in every single scene. And they also don't make a person feel like they're super badass. And you, again, a thing you don't do to dudes. Yeah, a, a thing that you don't do to dudes. And like the whole defense of like, but it's accurate but it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, all right? And sometimes problems, problems with stereotyping and sexism in one medium, when you keep them true, amplifies those problems in a secondary medium. It makes them a million times worse. This character is an offensive, horny little dream. This is not cool. Yeah, yeah, seeing her move around and be like the tiniest, but also like the biggest and most powerful. I'm like, what? Whose wet dream is rollerballing around this little screen right now? I, and also, she's a teen. <laughs> I really do think that when she gets her own body and morphs boobs, and the doctor goes, I guess she's a bit older than we thought. I, the legitimate line from the yeah, movie. Yeah, that's, he's not exact. That's the, that's the, one. the line. That's James the Cameron one. wrote that yeah. line. I guess she's older than we thought as this teenage daughter born sexy yesterday character grows boobs in front of us. I feel like that was where it really went far. And aside from that, it just exists in an uncanny valley that is upsetting to look at. A aside from all of these sexist stereotypes that this deals in, if this was just a te test footage with no acting, no voiceover, no story, no writing, this is just the look of a character who exists and stands next to Christopher Waltz, then I would just be like, uh, I'm upset, Christoph Waltz. I'd be like, I'm upset. Yes. I am upset that you exist. I don't like looking at you. You are triggering my fight or flight mechanism. My lizard brain is telling me to destroy you with fire you aren't real and you upset me. You aren't real, but you're pretending at a close enough level that I'm like, get it, mm -hmm. ah, it might sneak in. Yeah. I might be the last defense of this getting through the lines is what your brain is telling you. Absolutely, yeah, it's way too close. And also, but like, other people's faces aren't CG'd in any way. Every other cyborg we meet, it's their human face floating in their cyborg body and nothing's changed. Like, you know, they have big arms and big legs and everything on their body's changed. She has the only CG face. I think they do the same with her people in the her flashbacks. Her people, yes. But like, so, when but, people meet her on the streets, they should be like, what the fuck is wrong with your eyes? Yeah. They You're should be a like, Martian. Huh, an arm. <laughs> An arm, yeah. Like, why is no? Why is everyone cool about the fact that she's got a weird face? Because mm -hmm. like, or because no one else's face looks like this. Everyone else just got their heads put on robot bodies. Yeah. And so it's also like it doesn't fit the world. It's not like everyone's got a CG face or everyone who at least is a cyborg. Yeah, it's just it's just her. It's yeah. just her, and it should and everyone should notice. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's so much about the writing of the character and the look of the character that is. Uh, in different variations of offensive, boring, and upsetting at the same time. Yeah. Uh, A yes. real trifecta of terrible in how they've executed this character. That said, uh, uh, Rose Salazar, 
does a phenomenal job of the performance. There, there are straight up moments where I'm like, you are crushing this. I do not know where executive producer James Cameron finds these people like Rose Salazar and Zoe Zeldana and gets this lucky to be like, I have found actresses who are willing to give everything to existing, not existing on screen and dedicate so hard. I will completely agree with that. I think Rosa Salazar, who I've never seen anything before or since, is wonderful. This like sense of she does have, I will, I will be fair, like a sense of innocence and power mixed together that is very interesting and kind of hard to do. A sense of like, I have agency, but also I'm new to this world. Like, I don't like the writing of this character, but she has found it and performed it wonderfully. She's really like, she was really, as you said, all in. And I don't know how much of her own like fighting she did or how much of whatever Alita's doing fight wise is motion capture or just completely CG'd, but. Just in terms of just acting, as far as I'm concerned, she is wonderful. She did a great job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Perfect blend of of innocence and strength. Even when when the writing doesn't understand it, she understands it as a performer, mm. and that really comes through. She read the manga, probably. <laughs> if that's appropriate if that, slash better. If that gives you any more insight into Alita. Yeah, yeah. But she she sustains this film when the writing fails it. Uh, and sells things that nothing else gets sold properly as in this movie. Yeah, and sometimes she's given such wild things to work with. The scene where she takes her heart out and <laughs> offers it to that dumb boy. Woo! <laughs> Like, basically, like, is the overly attached girlfriend meme from, like, no! 1998 or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah, the hell yeah. ages ago that was? She opens up her own chest and takes out her heart, and her heart is, like, the, the most powerful thing in her body, literally. It's this piece of technology. And in the universe. In the universe, yeah. yeah. She takes it out, and she's like, we can sell this for millions of dollars, and I'll literally, quite literally, give you my heart, and we can escape to a better place. And he has to be like, put that back in your chest, please? <laughs> and then she says... That got a little intense, didn't it? <laughs> and it did. It was fucking weird. I feel like that should have been the moment that guy realized that, like, this is a, a, a full cyborg who's going to kill me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that In that moment, she felt like Bella from Twilight. Ooh. To, like, to, bring, to tie in the YA of it all, to be like, I don't even care. Fuck my whole life up. Bite me. And, yeah. Turn and, me into a vampire. And just another, uh, like, a dude having to be like, what are we talking about? You've got to chill out. You must calm down. You know what else it reminded me of? This is very specific, but I think you'll recall it. In the 90s Spider-Man animated, there's a scene where Mary Jane just jumps off a roof uh. to prove that Peter will always catch her. Just straight up leaps. And he's like, what the fuck was that? A Lois Lane move as well from the Superman movies. I think that was Superman 2 that she might have didn't done that. Mm. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a classic. That's it's a, classic a classic crazy person thing. It was a little bit thing. crazier when Mary Jane did it. For some, I think because Spider-Man's powers are not as omnipotent as Superman's. Yeah, that, it's a, there's still a slight risk factor involved. Have you met Gwen Stacy? <laughs> <laughs> didn't quite work when mm -hmm. she fell. Yeah. I think Mary Jane hadn't. I think you got to have a talk with Mary Jane afterwards to be like, this isn't a you good not, thing to do. Do not do that ever The again. numbers aren't in your favor about this, Mary Jane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so just uh, a wild scene. Alita is completely insane. Yes. But to be fair, they're all insane. Like Christoph Waltz's character of Dr. Dyson, I think is straight up a villain in this. He is a bad man who is treating Alita as his surrogate daughter in every regard and is not doing it out of the kindness of his heart. Like, he is a man who is from the upper class, mm -hmm. who then uh, plummeted, but then also served a bunch of, like, gangs and, like, worked in gangland violence, who then works as a mercenary in his spare time. And he's like, oh, it's just to help the clinic. When the opening shot is a dude who's who's like missing an arm at the clinic who has essentially just like a little like a claw from like an arcade game where you try to pick up a prize. And Dr. Dyson's like, that's the best I can do. And then Alita <laughs> Battle Angel comes out and is like, I'm a tank. I'm a human. Overnight you did. All of your money went into recreating your daughter and you do not at all care about the public. You to, are, oh, to be fair, he had that body laying around. 
And was not using it no, for anyone no, else no, who needed it, it all could, of these parts. It could only be for a surrogate daughter, but he didn't like build that in a night. And when 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 a dude is walking out with the prize claw machine for an arm, <laughs> and, and he's like, that's the best I can do. I'm like, I know for an absolute fact it is not. We've seen some very good work for from you, sir. Yes. Now I actually I actually mildly disagree. Um, I think he's a wildly interesting character, not in this movie, but on paper. I think a, I think a doctor who needs, it's very Breaking Bad to me, of a doctor who kills in order to keep his clinic open to save lives, I think is like Dexter level, like Breaking Bad kind of interesting, mm. of like a moral gray area. Like I only kill criminals and I have like, I'm an official bounty hunter and I'm, I'm, I'm deputized by the law. Um, and I only do it enough to make the mo enough money to keep the clinic open because I also feel like he's just jammed. Like he's got, he had to replace every limb of another guy later who got hacked up. Like that's going to be his whole day. He's got so many people getting their limbs stolen who need like all of his help. So I just, on paper, I'm like, this is a wildly interesting character who is perhaps a villain and also like way too instantly into Alita is my daughter. I, I agree with you. He is interesting as an anti-hero. And if written as that was and the star of his own movie, that is a cool anti-hero. But instead he's like, I'm your sweet papa. It's me, papa. And I'm like, you are a horrifying man who's oh, yes. been involved in nothing but murders and mob activity your entire life and is only keeping this woman alive to force her to be your daughter against her will to the point where when she asks for her own body back, you deny her and say, no, you have to keep my daughter's body. <laughs> so you, like- You take what I give you. Yeah, yeah. To, Who gave you chocolate? Alita, Alita like, at one point literally says, I'm not your daughter. And he doesn't agree. He's just like, I like keep my keep my daughter's body, please. Yeah. He thinks that's his daughter. Oh, of course, he gave her the name, mm -hmm. the same name as the daughter. Absolutely, this is his daughter. Yes, he's he's not written as a villain, and he should be. I think every character, I think a, such a quick write around of characters like this is when he goes, "I'm not a hero," and then the audience automatically goes, "Oh, I guess he is." He mm. doesn't think he's a hero, or he thinks he is a bad guy. So we will believe the reverse because he's being hard on himself. Um, but yeah, on paper, a very interesting character. I will say. I think if she leaves, he kills her. Oh, mm. like I think he is truly, completely insane and an I don't untrustworthy think he kills murderer. Her, but I think he doesn't let her leave. Like he keeps following her. He'd go to Motorball. He'd go to wherever she was. He'd track her down. Mm. I think he'd keep tracking her down. Yeah. I don't know if he would kill her. Nah. He, scary man. Scary, scary man. Scary man, but also very silly. Like that big I hammer love... with the rocket on it. Now that's playful and fun. That's fun. Yes. That, the idea that like I'm not a cyborg, so the only way I can kill cyborgs is this comically, hugely large hammer with a rocket on it is so, like just shoot people. Just get it. Oh, guns are illegal. Yeah. You can't, never mind. So yeah, he's hauling this giant suitcase around trying to assassinate people. <laughs> Bigger than him. And the razor thin line of the legality of guns are illegal in this world to be like, it's not a gun. It's a hammer with an explosion behind it. That's a bullet. A, ham a hammer with a small explosion behind it is what a bullet is. You've just made a retrievable bullet. Yeah, the same with the guy whose like, hands become like rope darts. Yeah. That's just bullets that come back into your hands. Those are hand bullets. That re Those are boomerang bullets, basically. Mm. These are guns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are guns. And I love... And <laughs> the I yeah, you're the line of no guns, but literally every other weapon is totally fine. I would have been better if they didn't draw attention to it, because they have that line where they're like, guns are illegal. It's punishable by death. Everything's punishable by death. Literally everything is punishable. Sports are punishable by death in this world. Literally, like, the main sport everyone watches, half of the people die every game. So if you made a gun, you would just rule this world. And it would I've be got like, the only gun. Oh, no, if I was caught, they would kill me. But everything kills you all of the time. It's murder world. It's murder. Yeah, how did they enforce no guns? Yeah. Who it doesn't, it's very dumb. It's very, it's very, very silly. dumb. It's very, very silly. The other very silly thing about Dr. Ida we have to talk about is when his daughter dies. Oh my God. Oh my God. This movie's so weird about violence. Like we were, 
for the most part, like we were touch and go on this movie. There were moments of silence where we didn't like it. There were moments where I think the movie got us and we yeah, were like, kind of oh, into this fight it. Scenes good and that was the only moment where we legitimate laughed out loud for a good five minutes, and it was meant to be a dramatic peak of the movie, where it's the flashback of his daughter dying, and he's been helping out. Um, I think motorball drug people. Well, no, he's been like. He's just been helping people, but he's got drugs because he's got like painkillers and like he's just a doctor who has drugs. Sure. Uh, and uh, and one guy comes to get drugs in the middle of the night. So he wakes up and he's like, hey, you get out of here. And then his daughter just rolls into the room. What's going on? And then the guy's like, I'm going to murder her. It doesn't say that, but just starts running at her with no lines. <laughs> And then pushes her, and then the camera cuts away, and it cuts back, and it's an empty wheelchair. So I guess he pushed her into oblivion. <laughs> Pure dust. He pushed her out of the timeline. He, he pushed Thanos her so hard. snapped her away somehow? Her <laughs> body is never shown. No, but the wheelchair is, if we just didn't cut back, I'd be like, oh no, she was murdered. But cutting back to an empty wheelchair with no blood, I'm like, where did she go? And the wheelchair was upright. So I'm like, wait, what even happened? What, literally, what happened when he collided with this daughter in the wheelchair? Oh. I can only guess he backhanded her and she flew out of it into a wall and died? Something like that. Something like that. But also what was, like, that was so funny. Such terrible editing of, like, she has to die. We're not going to show a child being killed. But also we will very poorly show how she died. But even just in terms of a backstory, Ido's like, it was my fault because I'm a doctor who has painkillers. Like, it wasn't like that guy was there for revenge and hated Ido. He wasn't there, like, and, like, Ido refused to, like, do surgery on him. He was literally just, a, like, a guy who broke into their house that wasn't on Ido at all. I do think it was a bad guy who Ido had helped previously. I if, guess. I do believe he said that like, like these were people personal. who worked with the crime syndicate and that he had been taking extra money to help. Mm. So I, I think that the, the implication is that him and his wife both at one point worked for Mahershala Ali's character, Vector. Uh, Vector. So I think that both of them worked for Vector. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, I'm out. And then the wife continued to work for Vector. Oh, so I do okay. think this was like a bad guy, but he a only uh, knew Gro Growinska type person that he knew through crime. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I do think it was a bad man, but still, it could have been anyone just looking for drugs. Yeah, it wasn't like a hit and your daughter got in the way. Yeah, the whole motivation of the scene was drugs, and then you gave him a stern talking to, and he pushed a child into oblivion. You gave a, him a little spook, and he was like, oh! in a In a very hurriedly unexplained scene. Yeah, this mm. movie is so weird about violence, because if you have a robot body, they will eviscerate you in any way. Like, even though you're a human, like you've got a human head and some of your body, rest of your body could be human, but you will be thrown into gears. You will be cut into five pieces. You will have all of your limbs ripped off. Horrific things will happen to you if you have a robot body. If you have a human body, they will not show you dying or they will just impale you with a sword cleanly with no blood coming out. Like the daughter is killed off screen. The dog is killed off screen, they, and I didn't want to see a dog die, but if you're going to kill a dog in a very violent movie, what is happening? Yeah, it, it, it's just a weird mix to be like, uh, Robert Rodriguez, you have you know, you know made Death Proof and Spy Kids, and this movie was both <laughs> okay, somehow. Was both. Like, you didn't choose a lane. Like, you needed to decide which this was, because I get that, like, and part of it is just these completely antiquated ideals of film ratings to begin with. Mm. You know, the NBAA as a whole to be like, well, if it's blue blood, then it's PG-13. Oh, yeah, because the cyborgs have blue blood. Cyborgs and have blue blood. Have red, yes. But if the cyborgs had red blood or even red oil, if they even said it was oil, it's an R-rated movie <laughs> all of a sudden. So it's just these really stupid color-coding-based antiquated ideals as to what makes a movie's rating. So it's a movie where they have blue blood and they can do horrific, terrifying body horror things. And then off camera, they murder a dog and child and really imply it. And they're like, but it's for kids. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. No, no it's, it's not. not for kids. You can't kill a dog in a movie for kids. 
Yeah. You can't kill a dog we've met several times. We know it's brave and cute. Mm -hmm. Who will now be avenged. Who Alina didn't even try to save. Made no effort. No effort. She saved him the first time, no problem, from mm -hmm. being stepped on by a big, big old robot. Yeah. And then the second time, she was just like, you're not going to do it. Oh, fuck, he did it. He did it. He did it. She wasn't being restrained. There wasn't anything stopping her. Uh-huh. Just, just, just let that a, dog die. Yeah, just a dog dies. Poor doggo. Is the, uh, it, it, I don't know what rating they were going for here. Mm. It's all over the place. It's a weird mix. Uh, can we talk about um, old motorball slash just rollerball? <laughs> it's just a thing that they stole. Uh, it's a thing they stole. It was probably my favorite part of the movie. Mm. I liked motorball. I thought it was like this. I thought the CG looked good. I thought the choreography was good. I was having fun with it. I would like to know the rules. I think that is Pretty one of the. Loose. I, I do think that is one of the problems of this movie. I I think you liked Motorball a bit better than me. I think the whole time it really bothered me because it looked the best. It was the most exciting. It was the peppiest thing. But I, it did reach a point where I'm like, this movie should be called Motorball. Like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. none of it, nothing else matters. Like, it, it became such a big thing. It's as if Star Wars Episode One was just called Pod Racing. I've had such Pod Racing flashbacks, especially that announcer who sounds like Greg Proops, who announces the the mm -hmm. Pod Race in Episode One. I was like, okay, it's the same thing, but it's like more, but it's better. But if Episode One was the only movie. And it had two pod racing scenes, but they still tried to lay all of the groundwork of the Star Wars universe. You know what I mean? Like, and then at the end, you had to win a big pod race to get up to the Death Star. Yeah. <laughs> Where it was like, I'm into, mo I'm into motorball. But by the third motorball scene, I'm like, why did I have to know what happened 500 years ago on Mars? Where not relevant to motorball. It is not relevant to the motorball movie I'm watching. Yeah. I don't often watch a basketball game. And they're like, do you know what happened in the Civil War? I'm like, no. I'm watching basketball. Like, stop doing this. Stop, stop bringing it up. So I think, and also, what are the rules? I think my big problem <laughs> with motorball is I either needed more or less of it, and what are the rules? I know you put the ball in the thing. <laughs> is it a team sport? What are we doing here? Yeah, the fact that they were like, I think it's normally teams, but when she tried out, they were like, just because these are tryouts, there's no teams this time. And I'm like, I feel like teams or no teams is two different sports. Yeah. Definitely, absolutely two different sports. Yeah. If you showed up to a basketball tryouts and we're like, okay, so it's tryouts, that means there's no teams. All 10 of you. What? <laughs> no passing the ball. No. Huh? <laughs> and also you can kill each other. Huh? <laughs> I'm trying to pitch your basketball with no teams. No, what the fuck? You can't just call an audible for no teams before a sports starts. All nine other guys would just tackle you. What would you no teams? No teams. <laughs> you would get one foot away. You would be fucked. I love how much this concept has tickled you. Just I'm sure it's every other sport, but I'm just just picturing like all my raptors just being totally bombarded by nine other guys. And also not being told until the jump ball, <laughs> until tip <laughs> off, like right before it starts. But by the like, way, no teams tonight. So many skills are team based. Like, exactly. I come up with plays. I'm a passer. I'm <laughs> Jesus. I'm really good at alley oops. You'll never do another one. <laughs> just no teams. Oh my god! <laughs> so, okay, so motorball is uh, fun in theory. In I agree. Theory. There should have been should have been a motorball it was, movie. It was the best edited sections. It was it flowed really smooth. And even though I didn't know the rules, I always knew where everyone was. The best like and coolest character design. All of the robots that were in motorball. I was like, holy shit! You came up with like throwaway robots that are really cool ideas and concepts i was yeah. really into it that's a good point each robot was very unique and also but like dangerous in its own way you were like oh no i see the advantages of you i see the disadvantages of this one yeah each robot was kind of lovingly lovingly put together they were all unique zapan's back the main oh, hunter zapan's killer back. bounty like if y'all if y'all didn't watch this movie go look up zapan uh like the character design it is phenomenally detailed meticulously done 
love that design. The design on the back was really, really cool. I wasn't so much in love with the very floatiness of his face that it wasn't kind of integrated into his own head, but the back and like the whole look of him and the sword, very, very cool. I thought screen was great. Who played Zapan? Yeah. Um, real Jude Law energy. Very strong Jude Law who energy. I, who is also a very good actor. So so really good, uh, really good fun villain energy from him. I will say I think uh, I think Hugo was a bit of a down point. Uh, the love interest boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just a little flat. Just a little um, kind of paint-by-numbers YA, I would say. Yeah, paint-by-numbers YA. And, like, I don't usually say this about people, but, like, just doesn't have the it factor as a person. Mm. Like, I'm like, this. you feel like Disney Channel, like, Olsen twin love interest, like, back in the 90s when they did movies. Like, you just don't have, like, oh, you're the cute boy. Well, and, and I think part of it, too, was uh, was also, like, just his character design. Because uh, I, I think everybody had a pretty unique character design, for better or worse. Like, all of the robots, uh, we agree, are, are immaculately done. Uh, Alita has problematic aspects, but was very well executed for what they were going for visually. Completely interesting to look at. Absolutely. I think uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Dyson and everything has like his, his uh, you know, his I'm in the lab look, the trench coat, the cool rocket hammer. Jennifer Connelly is living above her station. Yeah, is kind of dressed to... like I'm the high end person in the <laughs> Hunger Games or the inner circle people in the Hunger Games. Mahershala Ali basically is dressed like Blade and that works. But uh, the, you know, Hugo, the like the bad boy, they're like, let's put him in a, a where's like a leather jacket. He's like a in a, like a like a leather jacket. We won't. No, no, we haven't done anything to it. We just bought it at it's a leather a, jacket store. It's just a leather jacket we bought. Like a bandana. As a, he, a normal bandana. As he is dressed in this, I could rotoscope him and drop him into literally any other YA property. You give me a shot. You give me a shot from like Teen Wolf, or you give me a, a shot from Riverdale. I'm like, I can just drag and drop this dude in these exact clothes into anything for teens because they just did not give him a personality in in writing or character design as well. Yeah, no, he didn't have anything going on. He's not like these are my interests and like this is my look. Like, am I am I a punk? Am I American? Am I like what what are my influences? Yeah, there's there's nothing going on. Am I like am I like sand desert wear or am I like a, a foresty guy? What would my avatar be if James Cameron was here today and said yeah. you're an avatar um, or a Navi? Sorry, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, no no character in his design or in his depiction yeah. in any way. Yeah, I agree. to the point where I was like, I was kind of relieved when he became a cyborg. Because even though he didn't choose that body, I'm like, oh, that's some meat on the bones once you took away the actual bones. That's a once dude. You, once you didn't have bones, I'm like, oh, look at him. He's got, a, he's like blocky and he kind of sucks. He's got to deal with that. Alita's got this cool body and he's got this shitty cyborg body. Um, and then they just killed him again. <laughs> this was the wildest sequence of events of Hugo is stabbed with a blade and his body is dying. So they cut off his head and leave it so his head can become a cyborg. And they're like, he just made it. He's now a cyborg. And then he just gets cut to pieces on a, on a tube. Yep. Because I guess he doesn't know about the defenses that Alita knows about because she had a memory now. Mm -hmm. But it all just, it's very contrived. It's very, it's very contrived. contrived. And how many times can you cut off everything but just an arm on a person? It happened a lot in this movie. But when Alita did it, though, that was cool. That was cool. That was dope. Yeah, her fight scenes were really, really cool. All of them. But, like, yeah, I will say that actually was really cool when she completely defeated a guy literally just one-armed. No legs, no body, <laughs> no second arm. And she took down Grewinska. Grewinska? 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 Grewinska. Jackie Earl Haley. This um, guy who is set up as the villain who's done nothing? Who at one point we first meet Gruishka, uh, and all of Gruishka's sidekicks are just murdered in one scene in a second with the giant hammer with uh, the rocket on it. Was it was pretty cool. They got cool murder. They're and then like Gruishka gets a little bit hurt and like hobbles away, and you just hear it like off screen in the distance. Gruishka never forgets. And I like turn to you. I'm like, who's Gruishka? <laughs> We've never met you, my guy. I didn't know that was your name. You can't, in, like, there, I get it. It is very difficult to find an organic way to shoehorn a character's name into a script when it's not the first time you're meeting someone. 
it's difficult to introduce characters' proper names. The first time you hear a character's name should not be third person from a distance. Because I thought he worked for Gruishka. I thought the same I thing. I was like, okay, Mahershala Ali must be Gruishka. No, no, he's Vector. He's Vector. He's not. Who, who the fuck is Gruishka? Who the fuck is Gruishka? Who the fuck is Gruishka? I feel like Alita. I'm like, I don't know anything about this world. No one's told me who Gruishka is. George goddamn Costanza here referring to himself <laughs> in third person so hard that we think that somebody else is being referenced. Ah, very, very good. Yes, mm. yes, 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 yes. And then this movie like just does nothing with Gruishka. Wishka, but it pretends like it does. Like when Alita goes to the bounty hunter bar mm-hmm. and she tries to gather up bounty hunters and completely fails to like make a little army to go fight. She's like, Gruishka has been a plague on this city that we can't stop. I'm like, has he? We haven't seen or heard about that in any way. He went after you. Has anyone else had a problem with Gruishka? Nobody else seemed like they knew what was going on here. And and it was it, such a weird scene. It was kind of nice to see her fail. It was kind of nice. Which it, felt weird. It's weird to see a plot point that goes nowhere. Yeah. Like, the failure is not even referenced later. I'm okay with the failure if the failure, like, leads to learning something about yourself. Yeah, like, how to motivate mm. people. She's got to go read a self-help book of, yeah. like, how to make friends and motivate an army. But instead, she just fails and just, like, hits the reset switch. It yeah. doesn't really motivate the character whatsoever. For me, I think one of the bigger... Um, confusions of just being like, what are you, what are you trying to imply here? What is she proposing? Uh, we watch Rogue One, you guys. <laughs> what is she, propo- what is she Wild proposing? Wild line read. One of the best line reads. Uh, what is the relationship between um, Vector and Nova and uh, Chirin? Chirin? Shireen, Shireen, I believe. Sh- Shireen. So Shireen, played by Jennifer Con- Connelly, is the the ex-wife of Dr. Dyson, and she's now with Vector, mm-hmm. uh, played by Mahershala Ali. And Vector's like, hey, if you do enough bad stuff for me, I can get you into Zalem, the city in the sky where the rich people live. So I'm Vector. If you do enough for me, I can get you into Zalem. You're Shireen. And... Shireen, I cannot tell if she's playing him or he's playing her or if she knows she's being lied to. And also Vector is occasionally inhabited by and a pawn of Nova. So occasionally his eyes go blue and it's like, I'm not myself, I'm Nova. But then when he comes to, he knows that he's nothing more than a pawn. He remembers being taken over. He knows that Nova takes him over every now and then. Apparently there are no cell phones in this world where Nova can just like have a Zoom call. No, no phone He's got to take your body over and talk through you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't so much mind all this. I thought it was kind of clear. Um, I knew that he was playing Jennifer Connelly. Um, right. She genuinely thought she was going to go up to Zalem eventually. But the other thing that trips me out is that she knows that he says that as a false promise. I think she found out when he said that, when we when she said that the first time about Hugo. I think that was the first time she knew that he'd been promising that to other people. Okay. And I think okay. that was her moment of realization. But doesn't Nova, when he takes over Victor at one point, say, like, he can't give you that. I can give you that. So I need you to do this for me, not for him. I don't know. Yeah, there's too much. But there's... also Vector and Nova are the same? Question mark? Why they're different characters? I don't know. Uh, yeah, th- it's it's murky what's going on there. And then she just gets turned into a brain off screen. Off, another off screen yes, human murder. another human off screen murder. But also horrific. He opens up this cabinet and it's got eyes and a brain in it. And it's like, that's Jennifer Connelly. It's RoboCop-esque. Yes, yeah. yes, very RoboCop-esque. Very terrifying. Of like your mind's still alive and we stripped your body away and I'm like, ah! yeah, and 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 that's when Vector is like Nova likes body parts for his experiments, so that's how we send them up. Mm-hmm. Okay, what do, what do I do with this information? Now? Are we gonna stop you? Yeah. <laughs> And, event, and really, he just stops himself by being taken over by another person who's not in the room. Yes, and then Alita can kill him, yeah. Yeah, he, he gets killed standing still while someone else controls him. I will say, I it wasn't supposed to be funny, but I actually think this was incredible acting on Mahershala Ali's part of a body that's dying, but the person inside the body isn't. 
So Mahershal Ali's body is like falling and like bleeding out and falling to the ground and losing strength. But Nova's voice isn't getting any less strong because he's somewhere else. He's just talking to through him. So I'm like, that's actually really hard and really cool. You did a good job with this. When he looks down at his own sword wound and says, that looks fatal. Uh, that <laughs> with like just genuine curiosity, mm. that mm. was actually pretty fun and charming. Sucks for Vector. Yeah. I'll leave when he dies. And, and, you know, obviously we're getting big seeds of the Edward Norton character. Surely the movie will have sequels with an Edward Norton character. We're all here for Edward Norton. We're all waiting for the sequel with Edward Norton as Nova in Salem. Is Edward Norton a secret draw I don't know about in 2019? You know the YA draw, Edward Norton. Like, he didn't even get a second Hulk. <laughs> You were fired from the MCU, my dude. People he, don't like working with you. He doesn't get second movies. No, period. no, that's he's, not a thing you're allowed to have. No, not as Edward Norton. He doesn't. He's not a sequel guy. No, that's why they had to cancel the sequel. Yeah, that's that's. You know what? That is what killed it. Edward for Norton sure. was like, it's you Edward only Norton. get one. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm feeling I'm feeling good on Alita Battle Angel. If you're feeling good, I'm feeling like I got it out of my system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I really needed to get that off my chest. Yeah. Real mixed bag. It does look good, and there's a couple of good performances and some cool character design in here. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like one infuriating thing, and then kind of a fine movie after that. I would in I would ways, agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm glad I got you with the YA tip. I do feel like mm. the, uh, that. Yeah, you know, skew it a little younger, and it like the mm. problems kind of disappear. And I think that like un, you know it's unfortunate that it's the case, but a lot of the problematic stuff isn't noticed when it's skewed towards mm -hmm. a younger audience as well. So that kind of floats by without an issue. Maybe don't let her boobs just appear out of nowhere. Yeah, we could maybe scale that. Maybe back. there are things to change. A little bit. But yeah. luckily, we're coming up on what would you change? Yeah, yeah. the born <laughs> sexy, sexy yesterday trope is highly problematic without making her underage at the same time. But she's also three. But she's also 300, so it's okay. But she's a teen, but she's 300. Woof. Well, let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? So now that we've discussed everything we've discussed, what would you change about this if you could change anything? Uh, before we do ask the final question, we will remind you, as we so frequently do, to please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, wherever you might get your podcasts, wherever you're listening to this right now. It just takes a minute or two uh, to rate, review, and subscribe. And those reviews, the reviews are very important. Uh, as some apps will only let you rate. If it only lets you rate, just leave a rating. That's great. That helps us move up the charts and find new listeners. And if, it, if whatever app you use does let you leave a review, do that because then when people find our show, they check those reviews. They're more likely than to actually give this show a chance, hit subscribe, and start listening to us if there's nice positive reviews out there. We need your help. We need you to tell people that we're funny and good and we have uh, nice opinions and uh, we really appreciate it. They warm our hearts, they make us feel better, and they help potential listeners be like, mmm, sounds good. Think about when you read a review, how it makes you feel about like checking something out. Love it. Uh, and as well, if you want to support us monetarily, you can do that over on our Patreon. Uh, our Patreon is a monthly subscription service where you can subscribe at whatever level is in your budget uh, and you will get cool bonuses uh, or bonuses. I like a bonus, yeah. actually. I, I wish like this was October. Well, wait no, till... But like, but like a boon is like an extra thing. Oh, a boon. I was thinking of like a boon Oh, no, I'm a boon -ness. A boon uh, You will get uh, cool exclusive boonuses uh, over yeah! at our Patreon page, depending on what level you sign up at. At the $10 a month hero level, you get an exclusive episode of this podcast every single month. This month, we did RoboCop 2, uh, which is a very fun one. Uh, it is a, a very fun energy compared to the first RoboCop movie. Yeah, it's, it's a real alien to aliens. Yeah. 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 Both good, different ways. Different ways. Uh, so that is up right now and available currently on our Patreon page. And as well, when you sign up at that hero level, you get immediate access to the full back catalog as well. So that's lots of episodes, lots of content. You can play around there. And as well, you can also change your subscription level. You can cancel. You can drop down. You can move back up on a month-to-month -month basis, depending on what your budget is on that given month. And all of the stuff adds up. So even if you just sign up at uh, as a $1 patron, and even if you just do that for like a month or two, those dollars uh, help keep this network going and uh, and help uh, help us create the content that you love. It is so good, and we appreciate all our patrons so much. There's also yearly subscriptions, and if you sign up for a year, you get a month free. 
Awesome. Bonus. Free stuff. That's a bonus. It's a bonus month. That's a bonus. Uh, so head on over to patreon.com slash from superheroes. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash from superheroes. And thank you to all of our current and future patrons. Thank you, patrons. Uh... And now let's ask the final question of what would you change? Diana, what would you change? Um, Her eyes aren't big. But other than that, uh, my yes. yes, normal eyes, normal, normal eyes, normal eyes. Uh, her eyes are small. Uh, small now, actually. You know what? Not even normal. Small. <laughs> I'm overcompensating. No eyes at all. Oh, boy. Okay. Yeah. That's, a, that's not my change. All right. Uh, my actual change is, uh, this movie's mostly about motorball. It was my favorite part. It actually gives you, like, a structure, like a Mortal Kombat-esque, like you're going to the final battle. Um, it's because... Even in the movie, they say only the final champion of Motorball will get to go to Zalem. And we don't even see her ever get a point. She plays she plays Motorball twice, never gets a point, and then they just cuts to she the She gets end. one in the street game. Does she get one? Yeah, but that just makes it a tie. Oh, okay. She does get one. All right. Well, she doesn't get one on the actual Motorball court. She, she got a point against humans, mm-hmm. not cyborgs. Um, and then it just cuts to her, and she's the champion, and she's won the motorball. And I'm like, that was the most interesting part of this movie, and it also gave it structure. Like, you know, you you win the you win the entry level, you win the semis, you win the finals. Like, you got to have stages. It's a thing to go to. You got to get to Zalem, um, and you can have all these other little adventures about hacking people's limbs off in between. Like, this definitely needs. And she also played motorball so late. Like, she started playing, like, an hour into the movie, and it really had to be established much sooner. So I'm just adding more motorball and taking out a lot of just other scenes of her and Hugo. Like, she can just play motorball with Hugo more. He can be a, a motorballist. Um, he's played by someone else. Um, so a lot of changes going on. Mostly, I really liked motorball, and I want to watch Alita motorball. Um, Andrew, what would you change? Um, I, I love that. I love that. I, I could go either way on that, frankly. I either wanted more or less Motorball. Mm-hmm. So I am on board for your more Motorball movie. Uh, so I can get on board with that. Uh, my change, a quick silly one. Uh, I'm going to say the dog comes back at yeah! the end. Be- oh, as a cyborg dog. Yeah, because he literally dies next to the guy who converts dogs into cyborgs to save them. Fuck who yeah. Who loves dogs, who is the only man at the bounty hunter bar who chases off Gruinchka. Who joins with them because and, he killed a dog. And it's like, that dude doesn't like dogs. I hate that dude. Have him come back, and the little dog that could is now a little cyborg dog, and is okay, and is a cool cyborg dog with a nice owner and other dogs. I love this. Can it be very funny that he's actually kind of a big dog? But he's got a tiny little head. Oh, sure. Okay. Any, any, you know what? I love that. I love that. Uh, whatever kind of, no, it's your change. What, however you want this dog to be alive. Yes, 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 yes. I, I didn't have any yes, real yes, yes, imagery yes. in my head. It's just, I was like, as long as it happens, mm-hmm, he has mm-hmm, to be mm-hmm. back. And that's the big thing. We need this dog yeah. back. Yeah, we need this dog back, even if it became Alita's dog. Oh, that's because be cool Alita too. like fed it on the street. It was following Alita around and stuff like that. It doesn't need to stay with that. Guy. It could be Alita's dog or whatever. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna have your love interest die, a dog is actually like a good like. I still have you. Yeah. I still got you, good boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I love this. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things that I'm all about. Uh, the other thing, I, I I really don't know how to fix just like the politics of what they're trying to say. <laughs> I feel like they should say something, anything, where like the whole thing is a lie. Like I don't think the winner of roller ball or, or motorball actually gets to go up there. Yeah, like why? Why would that be a thing that if you win rollerball, you sincerely get to go up? Who's fact checking the winner of motorball doing okay up in Zalem? Yeah, because all of the other people who air quote went up were just killed and sent up in body parts for experiments. So I don't think anyone ever gets to go up. So why are you fighting? But either I digress. The other big change that I have in this that I think that she should have to wrestle with in the last act of the movie, rather than just cut to her being the motorball champion is when Dr. Dyson is like, this is your body now. It's from Mars. I can't repair it. Ooh. Any damage you you incur is permanent. And the idea that, yes, she is super fast, super strong, super powerful, but she is now mortal to mm. a certain degree, where all damage sustained is forever damage. If she loses a limb, 
she's lost that limb. She doesn't grow a new limb. He can't attach a new limb. Like, it is done. So the idea that, like, yes, you are amazing, but you still have to be careful because I can't repair you anymore. Oh, I love that. Limitations on the most powerful character is very interesting. Yeah. So I think, like, a, a, a forced mortality that she has to reckon with at the end, I think, is a very important thing. And it shouldn't just cut to her after years of being a, mor mo uh, a, a motorball tournament winner who has never really dealt with the most severe things she was told throughout this mm. entire movie. So that's what I that's one of the, my big changes is that I want to see her deal with the repercussions of I'm essentially mortal. I had to choose between immortality in a body that could be destroyed or mortality in a body that cannot be repaired. Mm, interesting. I love that. That brings like very fun like psychological implications that I think would also be fun with like a more anti-hero Dr. Dyson that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. an interesting movie you've come up with. Sweet. Mm, I love it. And there's a dog. And the dog is back and there's more motorball. Love it. She's, we did it. She's mortal. More motorball. A dog is there. I can't believe our changes for every movie isn't add a dog. <laughs> you know what? How is it not every single week? We should add a dog more. Every single week. Iron Giant next week. Next we're week. We're going to add a dog. And we'll add. We'll find a way. I think there is a dog. I actually somewhere. think there is a yeah. dog in Iron it's Giant. It's been a while. Well. but Well, next week we are going to be back and we are going to be talking about Iron Giant continuing our, uh, our, our robot, our mechanical month. Mechanical month. Mechanical month here on the podcast. So we will be back next week talking about Iron Giant. Mystical bomb. A mystical bomb between man, man and machine. machine. Man mechanical and machine. Month. Mechanical, mechanical month. month. Mechanical. Uh, and in the meantime, if you want to get a hold of us, you can find me on Instagram at Ivamy, I V I M E Y. You can find me, I'm still on Twitter at Words of Diana. And you can find both of us most places at From Superheroes. And we'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Bye.